The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. Secularism is a deception. It suggests a no God world. That man is his own God. But behind this is Satan himself. It's Satan himself. Nature does not accommodate that kind of vacuum. And no God world, not at all. One is always worshipping something or somebody. Let me just say that again. You are always worshipping something or somebody. You are either for God or against God. You are either for our Christ or against our Christ. There is no room for neutrality. There is no room for that kind of vacuum. And no God world, secularism is deception. Sin is basically a departure from God. When we are talking about sin, it's not fornication, lying. Sin is basically a departure from God. Everyone has turned to his own way. That is what the Bible says. And as people go their own way and do their own things, the world makes laws to shield their way of life, which is against God, and cause that human rights. So everything is right because they don't have solution to the kind of weakness man has. They tend to make laws to shield those kind of weakness. And so man is departing and departing away from God. We need a savior. We need to cause a revival that will bring people back to God. But how can the creator turn his back on the creator and determine what is right and wrong? Now, how can the one who has been created turn his back on the one who created him and now determine what is right and wrong for him? Where is the maker? Where is the maker's manual? There should be something wrong about secularism. See, recently, just some few days ago, an American congressman, a Democrat, and these are the government that we are going to receive soon, by January 20th. These are the people who are going to rule the world soon. Is Emmanuel Cleaver, a minister by training. He ended a congressional prayer with this statement. Amen. Because he's a black American. He said, Amen. And a woman. This is a big man. He didn't pray this prayer in the closet. He prayed it at the Congress Hall in Washington. When he was ending, now he's a minister by training. Very popular. Maybe the most popular. And then he ended his prayer saying, Amen. And a woman. And the way he described God, he made God nothing. He made God nothing. He, he made God to seem as if it is a thing that depending on your religion and how you define it. But he is a minister by training. When confronted, he justified himself that he was respecting gender balance of the Congress. And he was not remorseful at all. In fact, he claims that people came even to congratulate him. The world is lost and we need a savior. We just do not need a kind of revival that will happen to us in the church. But it must get to the streets. Otherwise, people like this will deceive many. Now, sit back and let's listen to his prayer. Peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. 
a man and a woman, uh, the comments that have uh, engendered a sort of a bipartisan rant against probably one of the more beloved congressmen uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm talking about the uh, Missouri Representative Manuel Cleaver, a, a minister by training, uh, who joins us now to explain why he said what he said. Uh, he joins us on the phone. Uh, minister, congressman, uh, a lot of people <laughs> took offense to what you said, that, that you were trying to make a gender politically correct statement when one didn't need to do that. What do you say? I say that, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, a society now that uh, participates in orchestrated outrage. 99.999% uh, of the people who are expressing outrage didn't even hear the prayer. The prayer wasn't wasn't uh, uh, for them. You talk, I'm talking to God on behalf of Congress, asking for unity and so forth, asking God to give us that strength to do that. Uh, then I ended the prayer by saying, amen. We have a record number of women in Congress, including the first chaplain in 240 years uh, of, uh, of the United States history. And, uh, and it goes actually back to the colonial uh, Congress. Um, and, and, and we've just gotten a, a, a first uh, female chaplain in the, in the, in the House. And no, that, all that's well and good. No, you're right. Well, that's well and good, Congressman. But the amen is actually from a Hebrew word that means so be it. It has nothing to do with gender. So were you just <laughs> that, making a point here or were you saying something bigger? Because a lot of people took offense by saying, well, now he's trying to, to sort of uh, gender proof God. No, and that's what I'm saying. People want to that we in our society now we look for opportunities to be outraged. Uh, I ended the prayer by saying amen. Which and it is a, it's a Hebrew comes from a Hebrew root word uh, and there are a lot of definitions of it but mainly it's interpreted to be uh, uh, true or uh, may it be uh, things like that. The 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 a woman uh, was after the prayer ended trying to recognize uh, the the record number of women now in Congress right. and we. So that is it. If a big man like this start ending his prayer, amen and a woman, and he is not remorseful, a minister, somebody who's supposed to be a minister of God. Young people will take it for joke. Soon, you see people say amen and a woman. You go to school, and then when somebody prays and say amen, somebody in their congregation will just shout a woman. Then, we can make laws and protect that. But you see, amen is not just so be it. And this man is saying that uh, his definition of God is something else. It is either uh, somebody or something. Yeah. May God have mercy. Now, but we need to rise and push back these pushbacks. Push back this pushback. The battle is not against anybody. It is against our Christ. You may think they are joking, but it is against our cries. And we need to stand up and then challenge these ones. Revelation 3, 14. Revelation 3, 14. Uh, it's not just saying that amen is just so be it. Now listen to Revelation 3, 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, This is the words of the amen or the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So, amen, or as people call amen, is not just uh, interpreted as so be it. It is the name of the faithful witness, even Jesus our Lord. And somebody shouldn't just say that it is gender balance because it's amen, so it's a woman. Now, he has talked about this many years. And now he decided to say it at a central place where the ripple effect can go widely and affect the world. May God have mercy. Now, when we are talking about unleashing into the world, we are being granted to be unleashed into such world. It is not just about emotionalism and prayer and charging, but let me tell you the reality. We are being unleashed into such a world. Into such a world, an environment controlled by Satan, sin, and the devil. Sin, the devil, and death, which is described in Colossians 1:13 as the kingdom of darkness. The world is a kingdom. 
it has a ruler, it has a king, and it has a domain. That is the subjects under the world, the kingdom, the system, and the territories the ruler surveys. The world has an agenda pushed by all the forces of hell. It spreads like gangrene. It is aimed at the corruption of the inhabitants of the earth. And that is the nature of its ruler. He came not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So when he's destroying human beings that God has created, he takes delight in that. And that is the world, the ruler of the world. And that is what he seeks to do, to corrupt what God has so beautifully created. The world has its own lifestyle, derived from its teachings. Since the fall, it has grown worse and worse. The world has its own lifestyle. And it is derived from what it teaches. Because from the teaching, we also conduct ourselves. And so what we believe, we act. So once the world is making us to believe certain things, it will produce some kind of behaviors. And soon people will say it doesn't matter. And I'm saying that since creation, this is getting worse. And we need Christians who will be able to stop this oppression of the enemy. Genesis 6 verse 5 says this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race has become on earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. King James says evil continually. So man is not able to think good because in man sin has entered. And he has con the devil is controlling his life. It is manifested in Romans chapter 1. And I want to take all the trouble to read Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 to 32. Romans 1 from 18 to 32. And I want you to pay close attention to the manifestation of this evil. Romans 1 from verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who su suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish heart was darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up over in the sinful desire of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relationship for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationship with women and were inflamed with lusts for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and receiving themselves the due punishment for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, 
They invent ways of doing evil. Now look at that. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also, now look at that, approve of those who practice them, even at the law courts. These things work. That is the world in which we want to unleash you. So it's, it's not a joke. We have to go there and combat with evil. And I want you to put on your full armor. For because we need to turn the tables around. And God must be Lord. The kingdoms of this world must be the kingdom of our God. We know no defeat. Jesus is our captain. And I want you to get prepared. As we launch out there into the deep, Ephesians chapter 4, looking at the manifestation of evil on this planet Earth. Some of um, the scriptures that actually paints what is going on. Ephesians 4 from verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in, in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Now, greed is idolatry. Verse 20. That, however... It's not the way of life you learn. We are different. But the world is giving itself over to all kinds of evil. You can add Isaiah 59, the whole of that chapter, and when you go home, read and look at the state of the world. It is in this world that Jesus was introduced. Hmm. He was introduced as an agent of transformation. Scripture says, and this is one of my favorite scriptures, John chapter 3, verse 17. John 3, 17. Now, normally we end at 16. And then we don't pay attention to the 17. So, John 3, 16 is very popular. So, once we get to 16, for God so loved the world. But I think this one is a big one too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. The King James says that the world might be saved through him. So God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is for this same purpose that we are being granted to be unleashed into the world, that this dead world, that this evil world will be saved through us. Now remember, when you are in school, you are introduced there as an agent of transformation. You are there not to condemn sinners because the sinner cannot save him or herself. So condemning the sinner is cost 90. You have done nothing. So what you need to do is that you avail yourself that the world, the sinner through you, will be saved. Hallelujah. So we are going out there as agents that people through us will find our Savior Jesus Christ. As Jesus was prepared and anointed for the tax, so are we prepared and anointed for the tax. You see, what we are doing this week is to let you know who you are. Otherwise, you are prepared and anointed for the tax already. We are only telling you the kind of person you are so that you go out there knowing that God is with you. You go out there with all the confidence that you can. God is already with us. Now, living for Christ in a perverse world. I'll spend some time talking about how we can live for Christ in this perverse world. Because whether you like it or not, we have unleashed you. So I'm imagining that you are in the world now, trying to be an agent of transformation. How do you live for Christ in a perverse, this crooked world of wickedness? See, many who go into the world, into schools, workplaces, etc., with a desire to live for Christ, soon find a mirage of challenges 
to their commitment. And they struggle to know how to come out victoriously. Many people just make some pledges and resolutions that you see after this unleashing conference. Now, when I go, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. Now, when he lands in school, just give him a week or two, then the challenges confront him. Either he buckles or he backs up and makes so many kinds of excuses. But I pray that it doesn't happen to us this time. In the name of Jesus. See, the world threatens to excuse us into its mode. Because see, when you go on there, the world is not just there for naught. Jesus said the prince of this world comes. That is why he said that, you see, the, between the kingdom of God is suffering violence. And if you take the violence, you take it by force. In fact, if I were the devil, I would not sit down for the kingdom of God to come and overthrow my kingdom. So he fights back. So when you get to school, it is a battle. Don't give up because of the challenges. You need to just strengthen yourself and battle. Let us avail ourselves that through us, many will come to the saving knowledge of Christ so that we are not skewed into the world's mold. See, many years ago, a bishop of Uganda said this about these people. The Baganda, the Baganda, the Baganda is the largest ethnic group in Uganda. And this is what the bishop said. If you can project it, I want us to read together. If you can project it. Now, if you are ready, let's go. If it came to eight, I think the Baganda would be ready to die for Christ today. It is living for him that they find difficult. Yeah. People want to die for political leaders. So I'm sure somebody will want to die for Christ. But we are not called for, for us to die for him. He has died for us. We don't need that. But we need to live. We are living sacrifices. We are not dead sacrifices. He says that if it came to dying for Christ, he's sure that the Baganda people will die for him. He's sure that the Ghanaians will die for him. People will go to church, and if you look at the, how audacious their faces, when you start prayer, about 10 young men will come and stand in front of every mic and hold their ears and begin to scream, begin to scream. <laughs> My boy told me that when he went to the university, he didn't know how to pray this kind of prayer. And then you see that somehow some people will just eh, hold their waist like that. Then begin to shout, hum, hum. Say, hey, these people. Then he also decided that he would try. And when they say, hum, he used to say, hum. When you look at them praying like this, you think that they will even die for Christ. But when it comes to living for him, that is a challenge. We are not dying now. So we must prepare our minds to live for him. So that the world through us might be saved. That the world through us might be saved. How do we survive in this crooked and perverse world? How do we overcome and save people from the kingdom of the devil? I will offer some few tips as I have received from the Lord. Humbly particularly from the book of Daniel and from that man in particular. Number one, we need to have a clear-cut resolution. Know who you are and declare who you are. We need to have a clear-cut resolution. Now, as you go back to school, have a clear-cut resolution. Maybe you are to your workplace, have a clear-cut resolution this year. Know who you are and declare who you are. Why am I saying this? Daniel 1 verse 8. Daniel 1 verse 8. Very popular verse. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief officials for permission not to defile himself this way. You see, I think we all know this. Or if you don't know, it's one of the popular verses in Daniel. See, right at the start of his training, he made a firm decision. The people knew what he stood for. Right at the beginning of the training. You see, this, this declaration was made right at the beginning. Once they brought their food, they said, we will not eat. 
right at the beginning. So the people knew the principles on which he stood on. Sometimes we hide our Christianity, and that becomes a problem to us. Declare who you are. Declare who you are. Let your friends know that this is who you are. See, when I was growing up humbly, I would always declare who I was. And up to today, I would declare who I am. And beyond that, I tried in my mind to be the pastor among the pastors, to be the Christian among the Christians. Tried, set myself higher standards, higher standards that I will pastor the pastors when pastors meet. And when we were boys, I tried to be the best Christian among them. <laughs> I remember when I was in Thomas Secondary School. They used to call me Sir Holiness. <laughs> I've just remembered Sir Holiness. You see, because I set myself higher standards. And for them to give you, uh, this one is not from the Queen of England. This one is from my own colleagues. And I thank God for that. Set yourself higher standards. Right at the beginning. Let people know who you are. And stick to it. Know what you stand for. Right at the start of his training, he made a firm decision. The people knew what he stood for. 